Hello everyone and welcome to the Holy Bethel Church of God in Christ Saturday morning Sunday school. Our pastors are Dr. Roosevelt Allen Jr. and First Lady Rosetta T. Allen. Now come join us as we go step by step on this journey through the Word of God in order to study and show ourselves approved, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth. We now join in with today's lesson entitled, Healed by Faith. In the hands of Elder Teatra Scott as he teaches us from heaven as the Lord directs as how we are healed by faith. God bless you, Elder Scott. And good morning, First Lady, and um, anybody that's on the morning. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are excited about the word of God as always. And it is the word of God that has our souls being blessed of the Lord. This morning, we have this wonderful Sunday school lesson, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to even be found teaching. Uh, I do want to honor our, our pastors, Pastor Roosevelt Allen, our first lady, first lady Rosetta Allen, we thank and praise God for both of them and the work that God is doing in them. And so this morning, we're going to go into our, our Bible study. And the topic today uh, is healed by faith, healed by faith. Automatically, I remember when I was first studying for this lesson and I saw healed by faith. Uh, I remember when I first got saved and when I got saved, we would hear of things of healed by faith and how to be healed. And there are so many different types of teachings about healing. And I was taught that, uh, yes, the just shall live by faith and faith does come by hearing the word of God, but we really weren't taught about being healed by faith. And I mean taught, I mean that God, not only is he a healer, but he gives us the faith to be healed. And uh, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and begin reading into this lesson because this is a unique uh, parallel message, which has, it's almost like it's two stories being combined into one, but they both have great significance to each other. And I pray that the Lord will meet us right where we are in this lesson. So without any further ado, we'll be uh, reading today uh, from the book of St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. I'll be reading from verses 18 to 26. And just so you'll know, it'll be St. Matthew, the ninth chapter, uh, verses 18 through 26. I'll be reading the King James Version, and then we'll go into a little bit more um, exploratory and uh, get a chance to talk about uh, these scriptures. So again, uh, St. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 18 through 26. If any of you uh, uh, want to have like different questions or if you'd like to make comments, you'll just hit your star six, which will unmute you. And then after you've made your comments, by all means, uh, by all means, just hit star six again, which will mute you back uh, again. So here we go. Uh, St. Matthew, verse Chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came certain rulers and worshiped him, saying, My daughter even now, excuse me, is even now dead. But come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, and behold a woman which was diseased with the issue of blood 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Verse 22, but Jesus turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith have made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the, and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in 
and took her by the hand, and the maid rose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. So here is these the, here are these scenarios where Jesus was ministering the word of God, and it seemingly out of nowhere came these needs. Let me give you a little background of what was going on so that we can pick up to where this this story begins, because I found out it's always good to know what was taking place prior to the situation. So it gives our mind opportunity to jump right into it, and then we can understand what was going on. Now, as you recall, uh, those that were here last week, uh, last week we talked about uh, the subject, why are you afraid? And in our subject we talked about, which came out of Matthew, the eighth chapter, uh, verses 23 to 27, we found out that the disciples of Jesus got onto a boat with Jesus because Jesus said, let us pass to the other side. The other side that he's referring to is uh, the other side of this uh, area of Galilee. And they were going to this place uh, called the uh, coast of the Gadarians. Well, while they were headed over to this other side, Jesus was exhausted because he had been ministering the word of God uh, so much he was tired and he went to the latter part of the ship and went to sleep. And then the Bible talks about there was a, a storm that arose seemingly out of nowhere and it got to a point where even the waters and the waves began uh, beating vehemently and coming into their ship and the disciples were afraid and they came and got Jesus and they shook Jesus and they were like, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? Don't you understand? Don't you see what's going on? And then Jesus told them, oh, ye of little faith. And he rebukes the actual wind and he rebukes the seas. And the Bible said there was a great calm in so much that they said, my God, they said, uh, even the winds and the waves, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him. And they're realizing Jesus is not just this regular man. And even that the elements, because they've already seen him doing healing and healing and healing, but then even the elements, he has power over the elements. Now, before then, the Bible says that Jesus had been going all throughout those areas and he had been healing the sick, those that had different uh, sicknesses like palsies. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, palsies is a debilitating disease. It causes the nerves to be able to become paralyzed in so much it might be your face or your arms or your legs, but he was healing all of these people at this time instantly. And then not only that, but even as he was healing, at the same time, he's preaching to them about the kingdom of God. Well, in preaching about the kingdom of God, Jesus started dealing with things about hypocrisy. And he started showing that these religious leaders that they had at the time there, these scribes, these Sadducees, these Pharisees, he was showing that they were hypocrites and how they spoke about the things of God, but they themselves weren't doing the things of God. So the, the actual, these religious leaders, they hated Jesus. They wanted not only to destroy the word that he was preaching, but they wanted to kill him. So we find out that as we go on into the uh, scripture, Jesus had taken uh, his disciples everywhere he went. And now they had two discretions or uh, disgruntles against Jesus. One disgruntle that they had, these are these religious leaders, it was that his disciples, he was, he was going and taking his disciples and eating with sinners. And they felt like that was wrong to do. The other disgruntle they had was they felt that their disciples of Jesus, they should be fasting and they weren't fasting. And so they were upset about this. And so then now we pick up at the ninth chapter, because that was all during the eighth chapter. And I meant to mention also in the eighth chapter, this is a chapter I also where uh, Matthew, which is one of the disciples, was called to be as a disciple. So when we pick up in the actual ninth chapter, uh, there were some very unique things that were taking place uh, already. And we find out that while Jesus was teaching this situation that comes, is that there is a ruler of the synagogue and his name is Jairus. Jairus comes to Jesus. And when we say a ruler of the synagogue, we want you to know he wasn't like a high priest 
but he was responsible for the actual daily administrations that took place in the synagogue. So Jairus comes and he comes to Jesus and the Bible says, and this is going in verses 18 through 19, he comes running up to Jesus and he, he begins to fall to, his, to the ground and begins to worship Jesus. And he says, my daughter, she's sick unto death, but if you would but lay your hands on her, she would live. So here's what I want to ask, first of all, to the class, because like I said, here is a situation out of nowhere. And many of us have been in situations where, you know, we find out information and it just comes to us so abruptly. And sometimes it seems so egregious. But here's what I want to uh, ask you all. Uh, and anyone having would like to answer, don't forget to hit star six. My question is, why do you think Jarvis brought his concern to Jesus? He could have come to anyone else. They had rulers and other rulers and scribes and Sadducees. But instead, and he didn't come to the doctors. Instead, he came to Jesus. Why do you think he came to Jesus? Anyone, star six. because he had heard about him and he believed that he could do it. Amen, amen, amen. He had heard about Jesus. As I mentioned uh, prior to this, uh, Jesus had been going about all over uh, Galilee and Capernaum mainly, uh, doing all types of healing and miracles. And the people heard about Jesus. They heard about him. And if you notice this, even the scripture says, and we know that this is uh, in Romans 10 and 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we talk about today, healed by faith, the, way, the only way that people can get healed is someone has got to have the faith to be healed and someone has got to have heard about Jesus. The beauty and what I like about this also is that whoever it is that shared, because uh, whether these people, whether Jairus was there in the crowds with Jesus prior to this or not, but well, one thing we do know, he heard that Jesus had been healing. And thank God for those of us that will go and share the good news of Jesus. And we need to be testifying even that much more that our God is a healer. And here's, and here's the thing, he comes and when it says he worshiped Jesus, it does not mean the word worship like, oh, I'm worshiping you as God. He, in other words, he acknowledged Jesus as being a great teacher. And he acknowledges Jesus that he believes that he actually is able to heal his daughter. Notice how uh, detrimental this is. He's saying his daughter is even near death. And you already know how we feel about our children. Those of you who have kids. I can only talk from the side of myself. I have a son and a daughter, but when anything goes on in their life, I immediately try to jump in there and whatever it takes, especially if they are sick or anything like that, I jump in there in, in a, within a minute, or within a moment to try to make sure that they can get what they need in order to be healed. So he comes to Jesus. He's asking Jesus, would you please come with me and if you will lay your hands on my daughter, even though she's near death, I believe you could heal her. And the Bible tells us this, and this is according to St. Mark 16, uh, 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So is there anyone else who would like to uh, say, why do you think? that uh, Jerry, he's bringing this need, this concern to Jesus, and he's believing that he could heal his daughter. Anyone have any more comments on that? I think um, also, I think we can look at ourselves, our natural selves. We yes. have a right now need. Yes. I'm sorry. When, when we have a right now mm -hmm. need, mm -hmm. we do whatever we have to do. That's right. In order to get that need satisfied. And so he was human. And so mm -hmm. I think that those are just our natural reactions when you, especially when it comes 
to your children. That's right. You do whatever you have to do mm -hmm. uh, to try to rectify, like you just said, when it comes to your children, yes. especially if they're sick, you do what you have to do to try to get the help that they need. And yes. I think that's just the um, that's just what we do. Amen. Um, so maybe that's you know that was that played into it. Yes. Amen. Thank you very much for sharing. Absolutely. We do what it takes. My, my, my question, and I tell you, a lot of times God, when he's dealing with me, he asks me, why is it that I have to come to him when it's almost a dead situation? Why don't we come to God? Well, and this is what he does with me. Scott, why didn't you come to me when it was just a small thing? Because we do have a tendency, we being human, we do have this tendency that we want to work this thing out. And it's almost as if we don't want to really bother God with this situation. But a lot of times, whether it's healing, whether it's uh, things we have going on with our job, whether it's people we're having issues with relationship, a lot of times we should have the mental mentality like Jairus or Jairus and say, you know what, I'm bringing it to Jesus. Let me pray about it. One thing I'll say this, and I thank God for Holy Bethel being a praying church. <clears throat> Our church's foundation is built on prayer. And that's one thing I have never, I've had people try to accuse uh, things and say things with, about Holy Bethel, but one thing they will not say, and they will not say that this is not a praying church. And I thank God for that because the Bible says prayer changes things. And then it also goes on to say the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous, that means man or woman, availeth much. We have a God that hears and answers prayers, and I thank God for that. So here it is. Jairus is going with, I mean, Jesus is going, go ahead, I'm sorry. so very true and that's what we're trying to bring out is that a lot of times uh, we will try to handle things in and of ourselves uh, the bible says in hebrews uh, the book of hebrews that for when we have ceased from our labor then we can enter into the rest of god sometimes god will allow us just to wear ourselves out and wear ourselves down trying to be able to handle things that are really too big for us and the Lord, being so wise and so kind, he will allow situations to come in our life where we exclusively need him to move. And it does not matter how much we try to maneuver and figure out and stress out. That's what hindered the children of Israel. They thought that because they were crying all the time that God was moving because they would cry. They get into a situation and they would cry, help us, God, help us, God. And God was saying, I'm needing you not to just cry. I need you to mature and to be able to grow in faith. 
And if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we need to grow in understanding and studying to show ourselves approved and getting in God's word and believing God's word because that's what increases our faith. Many times when people have all of this disbelief or unbelief, it's because they're not in the word of God. They're not in prayer. They're not being found doing the things that please God. For some reason, this man heard the word of God and heard that Jesus, who is the word of God, was able to heal his daughter. He comes and he's doing whatever he can. He's falling on his, his, his knees, begging Jesus, please come to my house. Please lay your hands on my daughter. Please heal her. And the Bible says Jesus begins to, to follow him. And as Jesus is following him, this is Matthew 9 and, and 20 and 21. This woman comes from seemingly nowhere. And this woman has an issue of blood. And when I talk about the issue of blood, she's hemorrhaging. She's had what's called men menstruating. And it is a condition that is an unclean flow of blood. I won't go all into it. You ladies know what I'm talking about. I don't know uh, how that is, but you all know. And I'm like, my God. But the Bible keenly says this woman has had this condition for 12 years. My God. And most of the time when anyone has had a condition for 12 years and it's been this disease, and let me just say this, this is considered a unclean disease. And according to Leviticus 15 in the Old Testament, anyone having an unclean disease could not associate with those that were healed, those that had no, had no disease. They couldn't touch them. They couldn't be touched by them because according to the law, if they touch anything, it would be considered as unclean also. And this woman realizes she's an outcast. She realizes for all these 12 years, I have not been able to associate with believers, with people that are considered the children of God. I've been considered as, you know, dirty, unclean. And think about it. Put yourself, and this is what I tried to do, put myself in this woman's condition. Have you ever felt like an outcast? Have you ever felt like you were never good enough for people? And no matter what you did, you just didn't fit in. You didn't blend. And the other part, which makes it so horrific, and all these people know of your condition. You know, one thing I, I found out, and I'll just say this as a side note, uh, many times, especially in church work, we don't allow ourselves to become bondable to people knowing our issues because we all have issues. This woman's issue is that she has this issue of blood that has made her to be an outcast among all these people. And the Bible says she came and she had to try her best because she said in her mind, if I could but touch the hem of his garment, I could be made whole. Somewhere she knew that Jesus was a healer. So here's my next question. Where do you think uh, that this woman got this faith to be healed? And look at how she used her faith. Where do you think she got this faith and how did she use her faith to get her needs met? Star six, if you, you feel, feel like you'd like to make a comment. Actually, I think the same thing, as I said about Jerry, she had heard about it because he was going through the town and uh, he was healing and delivering and setting people free all over. And same as for her, she had heard about what Jesus was doing. And that's the reason that she said, Okay. That's the reason that she said if, if she can touch the hem of his God, if she can get to him, you know, do the crowd. She had heard mm -hmm. about his healing just like Gary had did. And she believed that he could do it. Amen. That's Amen. It. And she had already fixated in her mind. And I want you to know, faith also shows you how to get to Jesus. The Bible says, when we come to him, we must first believe that he is God and he is a rewarder 
to them that diligently seek him. She's seeking after him. She's seeking after this healing. She knows it is something that's forbidden. Sometimes we have to be able to go past what is forbidden of man to get to God. I'm just going to be real. There are some times, amen, sometimes we have to go past what we consider uh, what man says that we should do or can't do, but we've got to get to God. We've got to get to Jesus. And the Bible says that at the same time, when Jesus was walking from uh, going with Jairus, that there were a crowd of people that were around him and they began to throng him and they began to put their hands on him. They were good. They were jeering him. And, and this woman, and this, I don't want to go past this too quick, but I, I think we need to really look at something real quick. This woman is sick. She is weak. She is suffering. And she has been suffering for 12 years. And you know, just truthfully, whenever anybody have had, most people that have had a condition for 12 years, they become very comfortable in it. When I say comfortable, I'm not saying they don't have pain, but they're used to having this. But I want you to know, she wasn't going around feeling real good. And then, oh, yeah, here's Jesus. Let me just walk over here and touch his him. No, she had a struggle even to get there. She had a struggle even to get close enough to him because these other people were excited. You know how it is. If you go to any sports arena and you see one of the stars and people are all around them, you can't get there. You can't just get there and walk up to them. And no doubt this woman, in order to touch his garment, she had to get down low. She had to get to her knees to touch his garment. And that's what I'm trying to say. Whatever it takes for us to get to a place, to humble ourselves, to use humility to get to Jesus, we need to get to Jesus, whatever it takes. And she had fixated in her mind, if I can just touch his hymn, I'll be made whole. And the Bible says, that she found and got her way through this crowd. And I don't know why, but in my mind, I'm picturing her trying to reach to touch his hymn. Because now we're not talking, Jesus is not surrounded by three or four people. No, this is a crowd of people. His disciples are there. The Pharisees are there. The scribes are there. People that have been healed are there. People who need to be healed are there. And yet she's finding her way and trying to get there. And she finally reaches out and was able to touch his hem of his garment. And the Bible says, Jesus stops and says, who touched me? Wait a second, who, who, who touched me? And let me just say this to you all so I don't uh, overlook this part. Right now we're talking out of Matthew 9, 9th chapter, verses 18 through 26. There are two other accounts of the same story one in Mark, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 34, and also in the book of St. Luke, the eighth chapter, verses 40 through 56. So I'm going to be combining all three stories together, even though all we read was Matthew 9, uh, ninth chapter, verses 18 through 26. But the other accounts give a little more detail also of the same account. So the Bible says that this woman, she touches Jesus him, and she immediately feels her healing take place. Jesus turns around and he says to the disciples, who touched me? And they're saying, Lord, all these people, and you want to know who touched me? And he says, no, he felt his virtue leave. Virtue come out of him. And I want you to know, it shows me something here. God is touched. And the Bible says, even in Hebrews, uh, that uh, Jesus is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus felt this woman, her need, and when she touched him and that was taken from, his, from him, he felt his virtue lead. And here's my next question. Why do you think that people are so reluctant to testify of God? In other words, that Jesus healed them. We'll testify real quickly about medicine, but why do people get reluctant to testify about Jesus being the one to heal us? Anyone? Star six. Because if you don't believe. 
believe he did it. <laughs> You're not going to testify. So you got to believe that it was him that did it. Mm-hmm. And you got to know that he did it. Because I feel like all my testimonies, I know for a surety that it was God that did it, uh, that it was God that said it. So mm-hmm. if you believe that God did it, whether whether he's here on this earth or people could see him or not, you believe it and you know it. So I think they'd be reluctant because they see the doctors, they know the doctors, mm-hmm. and the doctors give them medicines and say, this is for this, and it would take care of this. This is for that, and it would take care of that. And they believe it because mm-hmm. they get some some sort of relief. It don't hit it all, but they believe it because they get some sort of relief and because they can see the person mm-hmm. that's doing it. But if you have your faith in God yeah. and you know it's God that did it and you believe it's God that did it because anything you believe in and anything that your heart is set to, you will talk about it. You will tell about it. So okay. that's the that's okay. two different that I got. Okay, good, good, good. That's how we look at a thing. How we believe a thing. And if you're a person, and here's what I, I've seen with a lot of people, and I've done it myself, even when I was younger in the Lord, sometimes I didn't want people to know what I was going through. Because I knew if I told people what I was really going through, they would judge me. You tell somebody, hey, guess what? I have prostate cancer. What? And when people don't understand that, you got prostate and cancer. Oh, I know you must be, that must be contagious. I won't say nothing, but I ain't letting you touch me no more. Uh Uh-uh. A lot of times, we don't want people because, again, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to be bondable. We don't want to look like we have these type of needs or anything. We don't mind if we told somebody, oh, I had a headache. Yeah, I had a headache. Oh, no problem. But when you start telling people, I had cancer, or look at this woman here. She has an issue of blood, an unclean thing, where she couldn't, She if she would have told somebody and they would have found out, and, and she, if she did not get healed, she would have been probably brought before the magistrate and either put in jail or put out, uh, out of the city because that was looked at as being wrong. And notice this. Okay, yeah. So notice this also that what happens is she goes and she gets healed. Jesus now asked about who touched her. Now she goes at a point where she says, it was me, Lord. And she explains what her condition was. And as Jesus is listening, at the same time, someone comes and gets Jairus or Jairus. And when they come to Jairus, they said, Jairus, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter's dead. And you can just imagine. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I love my daughter. I don't know about you all. I know you all have daughters, some of you that have daughters. It's one thing to have a son. I have a son also. I love him. He is just a he is just a bundle of love to me. I love him, but he's a man. When it comes down to my daughter, let me tell you something. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Everybody used to know, uh, you know, when it came down to uh, Scott's daughter, don't, uh-uh, don't you even blink an eye the wrong way. Don't look the wrong way. He loved his daughter. Uh, y- y'all know, y'all, you know, uh, the daughters have this thing, this connection with father's hearts. And I mean, it, it'll pull on you to such a point where you're like, you know, hey, that's my daughter now. I don't care what you say. But this man was born a report that his daughter is now dead. And I'm sitting here, I put myself in Jairus' place, and I'm thinking, had this woman not come and touched that him, he could have probably been almost at the house. And if he would have been able to get to the house and touch her, she would have been made whole. But I had to sit here and wait. Sometimes, you know how we get, let's just be real. Sometimes we think, oh God, I'm trying to get the pastor's attention. I'm trying to get to Jesus. I'm trying to get somebody to listen to what I got to say. I have this need and these other folks ain't talking about nothing. He already told Jesus, she's near death. And all of a sudden this woman, she'd been with the thing. She'd been in this condition for 12 years. She can wait. That's how we feel. She can wait. 12 years, she don't even need to say nothing. Let me go over here and have him heal my daughter first. Then you can talk about this other healing. But no, let me get my daughter healed right now. And then he finds out you're 
daughter's dead. Mind you, they hadn't had people that were raised from the dead that they knew about while he was alive, well, you know, while his daughter was alive. They hadn't heard about anybody doing that. And Jesus said, he noticed and he discerned Jairus' thoughts and he says, no, she's not dead, she's yet sleeping. Bring, her, bring me to her. So they bring Jesus and Jesus goes there with the disciples. They go into Jairus' house and as soon as they get there, before they even got there, they hear the people, they're already playing the morning music. You know how folks do, but something's dead in your life, people are gonna sing some kind of song. They're praying, they're, they're having a funeral, there are people that are, are, are wailing and professional people crying and they're doing all these things. And Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus is like, what, what are all of y'all doing? Oh, she's dead now. And Jesus said, no, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And here there are people looking at Jesus like, oh, he done lost his mind. You know how people get? He done, oh, y'all done got one of these religious folks. They done got, they're fanatic talking about this woman. Did you, we checked her pulse. We know she dead. Matter of fact, Hey, James, John, so-and-so, ain't y'all, you got a doctor over there, Luke, hey, you can check her pulse, she dead. And Jesus realizes that all throughout that house and all throughout that area, they have all of this unbelief. And the Bible even said that there was no great work that Jesus could do because of people's unbelief. But so Jesus, when you see him having everyone put out of the house, because that's what we read earlier, he said, everyone have them all put out. And he put every one of them out. Sometimes in our life, whatever that thing is that's causing us to doubt God, causing us not to trust God, causing us not to believe God's word, put it out. And notice this, Jesus brings in all of his disciples, also Jer Jairus and his wife. He brings in faith. Sometimes you got to surround yourself with faithful people, people that just believe God. Let me tell you something. Believing God does not mean we understand God because his ways are so far above ours. As far as the heaven above from the earth beneath, so are his ways above ours. It isn't about understanding. It's believing God. And Jesus wanted to have that house filled with faith, people that believe him. Here's what we can see about being healed by faith. The healing by being healed by faith is us trusting that Jesus is able to do it. That's what the faith part is. The faith is never in us. In other words, I believe in myself and I have the power to heal. No, you don't. In and of ourselves, we do not. But if we will trust Jesus, we will trust God and trust that he's able to do it. All we've got to do is bring the word to them. Notice this. The person that is dead, the actual young lady who is 12 years old, she's, died, she's already died, but Jesus says, I'm coming to wake her up. She's just asleep. She does not have faith to be healed because the faith did not, is not it. She doesn't have faith. Right now she's dead. But Jairus or Jairus has faith for his daughter to be healed many times. Don't you know God will give us faith to pray for others and to be able to intercede for others and be able to say to others, listen, even though they may not have the faith, I have the faith for them. I have the faith to believe that Jesus wants to heal them. And when Jesus goes and you bring Jesus anywhere, anywhere there is a dead situation, I'm telling you, God will move. So then after putting everyone out of the house, Jesus goes into the room because they laughed at him. He put them all out who laughed at him to scorn. Let me just say it like this. There may be people laughing at you right now, but I want you to know there is coming a day that where every ungodly sinner, every ungodly person, every person that have laughed and scorned you and said all manner of evil against you, they're going to have to stand before the almighty God who's going to be standing on our behalf that we are the children of God. And you will find out the reaping from the people laughing may endure for a night, but I want you to know joy is coming in the morning. So Jesus goes and grabs the young lady, the maiden by the hand, and he goes as he grabs her by the hand, he raises her up and she lives. And the Bible says that the entire 
city, all those that were around, his fame spread from that miracle. And don't you know, if God did not allow us to have and need miracles in our life, we would not reverence him as the Christ, the son of the living God. And this is what he wants us to do is always whatever that need is, especially that need to be healed and delivered, bring that need to Jesus. It does not matter how serious and how bad it might look, bring that to Jesus because he is the healer of all the world's diseases. Bring it to Jesus. Don't worry about how big it is. Don't try to figure it out. Just bring it to Jesus. And I want you all to know, I pray to God because God would not have brought this lesson to us if he didn't expect us to now act on it. And I would just say, if you don't know of those that are sick among you, let's pray. Let us call for the elders of the church. Let us test God and let us see if the prayer of faith will not heal the sick because God has left that in his word for us to, tr to try and believe that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we think or even ask. God bless you, saints of God. I thank you all so much for your, your chiming in and your, your remarks and everything. I'm at this point now where we uh, have to turn it back over to our superintendent, Missionary Howe, and uh, we turn it over to you. God bless you, and may heaven smile upon all of you. Amen. Thank you, Elder Scott, for teaching us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for teaching us, O oh God, on this morning, our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. You are yes. so holy. You are so God. You are so great. You are so wonderful. Yes. And Lord, we know that you have spoken to us on this morning. You opened up our understanding, and we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Thank Lord. you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for healing our bodies. Yes. Thank you for healing our minds. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing our situation. Yes. Lord, just thank you for healing our thought processes. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Our shield. Yes. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I'm not even going to say anything about the lesson. It was so wonderful. Praise um, the Lord.